right. Well, welcome to another episode of the ADHC Talks, which is a podcast where we interview digital humanities scholars about their work and their projects. I'm Sarah Whitfer, and I'm the Digital Humanities Librarian at the University of Alabama Libraries. And today I'm joined by Rebecca Salser, who is Associate Professor of Dance and the Director of the Collaborative Arts Research Initiative at the University of Alabama, which is an intermediate, uh, Rebecca is an intermediate dance artist and educator and she creates dance films and co-directs the Dancing Digital No Boundaries Archive Project, which is supported by the National Endowment for Humanities. So welcome, Rebecca. I am I am deeply intimate with your project. I love your project, and I can't wait um, to share it with some other folks um, through this talk. So my first question is, can you tell me a little bit about your research? And what I'm particularly interested in is uh, when speaking of research, what makes you feel nerdy and excited? That's always my most <laughs> favorite part of the conversation. Well, thanks so much, Sarah, for having me on the podcast. And thanks also for your involvement with and advice on the Dancing Digital Project. You're really an integral part of it. And I'm grateful for that. So I wanted to be sure to say that. Um, I don't know if this qualifies as nerdy, but what gets me excited is dance and the body and what, what the body can teach us about ourselves and the world, what kinds of knowledge are stored in the body. Um, and then on a secondary level, because I work with dance film, and um, and now dance archiving. How in this in this new newish time we're in, when we go to screens to find knowledge, we go to screens to experience art. A lot of the time, what are the ways that embodied practice can be transmitted successfully via screens? There's some some paradox to it for me because um, when I started making dance films, you know, one of the things that um, really entranced me about it was that a certain amount of intimacy is more possible when you are recording. In some cases, I mean, you can get up close to a live dance performance too, but a lot of us experience dance performance distanced and um, there are ways that, you know, the paradox is that you're no longer sharing space and time necessarily with the performer, but you can feel more included um, and closer to what's happening. And so that's been a real interest of mine in terms of making dance films. Um, and now with this digital humanities component, component of what I'm doing, that kind of uh, grows out of that desire to share dance art. And, and to share it in ways that people are accessing it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the through line of what is going on with your project because it starts with this deeply artistic performance-based mode and it moves through formats and it sort of transcends I guess, categorization in a way, all the way through to, you know, what we're going to be talking more about linked open data and metadata in a little while. But, but the fact that it, it takes this intimate performance-based art form and moves all the way through into a highly computational project is deeply satisfying for me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so tell me about your history with digital humanities and sort of how you arrived at this project. I think you've sort of foreshadowed that a little bit, but um, how did you arrive at doing a digital humanities project? I know that you have a collaborator um, for the No Boundaries Archive 
Um, yeah, Giselle Mason. And sort of what were those conversations like early when you started that project and that collaboration and how did it get, how did it get to where it's at now? Um, yeah, so I, before I became an academic, I was a independent choreographer and performer and, um, I came to academia pretty late in life. Um, and I started making dance films while I was performing and making work in San Francisco. Um, so I was already a filmmaker um, when I joined academia. Um, and then when I got my first teaching jobs, they were not in urban centers. I had been living and making work in urban parts of the world where it's really easy to see performance. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that wasn't true of the locations I found myself in once I started teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so what became really clear to me quickly was how little um, access we all have to dance recordings, especially high quality recordings and full length recordings. Yeah. If you do a lot of searching, um, you know, you can see a lot of dance but oftentimes what you're seeing is, you know, a minute and a half of a 20 minute piece. Um, right. And there are a lot of reasons for that, that I've spent a lot of years thinking about, um, but it's still true, even post pandemic, even with a lot of new digital projects coming online, which is all good and positive and wonderful. Um, it's still really hard to um, access high quality or full length recordings of things that I wanna teach. Right. Um, so that was kind of my entry point. And um, I, as I learned about the challenges and some of the reasons why, um, you know, for, for 30 plus years, since, since the advent of video, there's been, you know, more of a push to, to have the access component in dance keep up with the technology. And it's, I, it hasn't, it hasn't for a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest ones is intellectual property and dances. Dan it, dance it can often be very collaborative with, you know, designers of costumes, lights, sets, um, composer, uh, stage manager, dramaturg. There are a lot of people that can contribute to a dance piece that all hold rights to the piece. Mm -hmm. um, choreographer obviously is somebody who holds rights. And so that makes it hard to disseminate work and especially hard to disseminate work that was made before the internet was a thing. Right. A lot of the, the contracts that people signed when they gave their work, for example, when they gave their old beta tapes to the New York Public Library did not include sharing on the level that we look for now. So um, it's hard when it, when recordings exist, it's hard to access them. Um, I've kind of gotten off my train of thought here. Um, anyway, so I was mostly concerned with sharing full length video and how to get that into the hands of audiences, but also educators and scholars. Um, if you imagine trying to teach choreography, or if you imagine trying to teach painting, um, where in a in a situation where you can only show like the bottom corner of the painting you're trying to teach like that's um an you know an analogy for what it's like to try to teach form in dance when you can just see excerpts and snippets um and i started off um just reaching out to people who especially we're connected with the Dance Heritage Coalition. Um, they have spearheaded a lot of dance preservation and access projects. And um, the former director of that organization, um, Libby Schmiegel, is now the library archivist and librarian for dance for the Library of Congress. And she was, she had led a lot of this sort of, she had led one really important previous effort to think about how to share um, recordings in a secure way that, you know, couldn't just be copied and disseminated. Um, and also she did a lot of work trying to um, 
cull some of those VHS tapes that were under choreographers' beds and help digitize things and pull things into a format that could be shared. Um, she's been really helpful and, and a great mentor and friend and cheerleader. And also um, Sally Ann Kriegsman, who was the direct the director of the dance area for the NEA for, for several years and ran Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival um, for a little bit. She was the executive director there and also uh, was, I think she was the president of the Dance Heritage Coalition as well. They've both been really helpful in telling me, you know, this is what's been tried before. This is what's worked before. This is what we can build on. Um, so the first... This is going to be a long answer, Sarah. It already has a long answer. Um, the first thing that I was able to do is pull a lot of experts together onto the University of Alabama campus to spend three days kind of discussing what's happened, what can we build on, what's needed now. Um, and that was really great. That was in 2019. And that group of 19 scholars, educators, notation specialists, legal specialists, um, kind of ended up pointing towards, we need to try to build something in a different way. Like there are things that exist now that serve as models and stepping stones and are important, but they're fundamentally built in a way that doesn't feel sustainable enough for us. Doesn't feel like it can encompass some of the needs that we have right now. So let's build something new. So that's kind of where that group landed after three days of discussions. Um, and then the question was, what does this need to be? What, what does this new thing need to be? Um, some of our priorities were a resource that shows full length videos of dance, a resource that can be more than one freestanding proprietary thing but can connect outward. That was really, really important. Um, in part because contemporary dance, especially modern and contemporary dance have tended to, like dance companies are often named after the choreographer. Um, and so that person's work kind of ends up in an archive sometimes. There are a lot of archives that are named for the choreographer that don't talk to each other. And there are a lot of connections between choreographers, but it's when everything is built on a different platform and everybody is underfunded and scrounging just to get the thing out into the world, it's hard to get to that next place where um, you can look across the internet and, and find resources. So those were a couple of the priorities. We also wanted to find material that represented um, BIPOC and women artists specifically because those artists are less represented online than men and European, men of European background for sure. Um, so we kind of started to brainstorm and look and think. And Sally Ann, who I mentioned earlier, um, knew Giselle Mason and knew her work and connected me to Giselle. And um, after several conversations and one presentation on a panel together, uh, it started to occur to us that we had pretty symbiotic projects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mine was Dancing Digital, kind of like a group of experts and specialists looking for material. And Giselle's was and is a 20 year performance project that she did um, commissioning and performing solo work by African-American contemporary choreographers that she had really um, comprehensively documented in beautiful ways. She documented rehearsals, she documented performances, she documented interviews with the, um, with the choreographers. She had kind of B-roll footage of her in the garden of a choreographer or um, on a subway going to rehearsal. Um, she had all the performances documented. I think I might've said that already, but she, she had been thinking archivally really early in the process in a, in a really beautiful way. Um, and she also 
had um and I'm um, just another thing that made me really fall in love with her project which is called no boundaries it's called no boundaries colon dancing the visions of contemporary black choreographers um was the the extended time period you know she's learned she and her younger body are learning work in the early 2000s and then performing the same like going back to check in and rehearse with the choreographers over the years and performing again the same work in 2018 and it i felt like the collection really showed a lot like leaned into the strengths that digital collections can surface. Um, so we began to collaborate in, I think it was January of 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, <laughs> we met in New York right before the pandemic. and But we realized that she had the perfect kind of seed uh, for not, of not only beautiful content, but something that could become an outgrowth of more content. Um, so then uh, we were uh, able to get funding from the NEH um, to build her um, a digital archive for the No Boundaries Project. Um, and then there's another chapter. Should I stop for a minute and take a breath or should I just go right to this next chapter? Well, I mean, I think the next thing we're going to do is talk about your current project. Oh, OK. So, you know as far as you want to go and then we will start talking about your current project which is very exciting to me it's all very exciting to me I I can't express I I sound like I'm just you know spouting hyperbole about my excitement but I'm your your project thrills me in so many ways thank you so <laughs> Um, you go as long as you want, as far as that goes, I think, um, you know, as you're talking through this, I, I really, you know, I love what you did with your symposium. And like, I think if we have a moment to sort of revisit what happened there, you said it was 19 scholars. Um, I believe that you had, did, did you have a little bit of grant funding for that? Yeah, we did. We had a planning grant from the NEH for that. And how did you select people to come? And what were those conversations like? How did you how did you sort of plan that out? You've talked a little bit about the outcome with, you know, some values in place and sort of um, a project more more defined and more scoped. Um, but. You know you you put that together how did you choose to did, did your mentors help you select people to invite yes my mentors were fabulous connectors both of them um they both know everybody and because they've been working working towards better access they kind of know what's yeah. new and upcoming and they were great connectors i also spent a few years before the symposium um proposing uh, panels at conferences and speaking at conferences, you know, doing presentations. And so those um, those conference moments allowed me to also create a network um, right. that I could draw on to pull these people together. Yeah. So it really was people from um, most of the people were from the U.S. We had um, uh, Eugenia Kim from Hong Kong was here, but she was the only non-U.S. person. Okay. And a lot of them had a connection to an existing digital project or a previous one. Right. Um, there are several really beautiful digital dance projects that have become obsolete because yes. the software has been retired or the, um, you know, like something that runs on flash player, for example, um, or just it's hard to, find the continuous funding to sort of feed these projects. Yeah. One of the people I met, Sybil Husky, um, from a university of um, North Carolina, um, she had a project called a Video Collaboratory, and she was part of the advisory committee and came to that. Um, 
symposium, she said, she said, Rebecca, you're having a baby who's never going to grow up. <laughs> and that's just really stuck with me because it's kind of, it, it's proven to be true in so many ways. Yeah. You know, like, you're going to build a thing, but then the thing is going to need care and it's going to need feeding always as long as it's going to exist. It's always going to need that. When you stop doing that, it will go away and not be accessible again. Um, so that was an important revelation <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested in some of these conversations because I often am working with folks who are at the very beginning of their careers and perhaps even graduate students. And the the notion of this network building and this collaboration, the spirit of collaboration, I think is very, you know, it can be very intimidating and people don't know where to start with it. And I think, you know, being able to talk to someone who has taken advantage of mentorship and has built a strong network of peers and colleagues to to lean on as you're working through a project like this and having people tell you things like, you know, sustainability and preservation are big question marks when you go into a digital project. Um, and there are things that you probably should think about, you know, at the beginning and not at the end. Um, because if you spend 10 years building something, some of the technology might be obsolete by the time you're finished building it. And then that's 10 years of your life. Yeah. You know, um, there are some really beautiful digital archives that have been in dance that have been built on a shoestring because, you know, dance is perennially underfunded. Um, yeah. One of them is built on FileMaker Pro. Oh, yes. Um, one of them is built with Salesforce. And just because the people doing these, you know, heroic acts of preservation, <laughs> that's what is available to them. That's what, yeah. you know, a board member has access to Salesforce, for example, and can give you that for free, but it's not, it does not set you up to connect to anybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just, I'm underlining what you just said in terms of yeah. how, you know, thinking about the longevity of, of what you're building on and what its possibilities might be long-term or is really important. Yeah. There was a special issue several issues ago in um, Digital Humanities Quarterly where scholars were discussing minimal computing and I found it so very eye-opening. They challenged, I think the, the editors of the special issue challenged us as practitioners to consider the possibility that our project could be carried somewhere that doesn't have internet and accessed on an, on a flash drive. Like, what does that look like? Yes. And how do you build that out? And how do you take advantage of some of the very sophisticated technologies that allow for these very complicated projects, but also think about um, like how minimal access could happen with our projects and also as a measure of preservation what are the archival standards for file preservation so that if the project that we've built out disintegrates through attrition we still have the original raw files of data that we could build out another project right. for so things like um metadata and wav files and tiffs and JPEGs, like making sure that we have yeah. access to the archival standards so that the data is preserved even when the project dies. And that's, I think, a very interesting sort of spectrum to think about when you're um when you're building a project out because your heart is going into this, like you you, you think about that final polished project. Yeah. But really, all of the labor is going into collecting and organizing and preserving the data. Yeah. And sometimes people forget about the preservation portion of it. Yeah. Know? And now I'm going to step into an area I don't know enough to talk about intelligence. <laughs> so please consider this thoroughly rough draft. But um, 
you know, in terms of video and sharing video, there is the triple IF format mm -hmm. and, um, you know, universal viewers as an, like there are some opportunities for um, ways to be creative about who's holding the actual files and, and the ramifications of that. If yeah. that makes sense. I can't say much more and be intelligent about it, but just, um, yeah. Where do you deposit your, your yeah. data files? Do you put them into an arc, you know, into an archive or do you put yeah. them into an institutional repository? Uh, do you want them to be um, democratically accessible? Is it who has the rights to them? If they, if they have super, you know, clear rights and it's not open access or creative commons exactly. content, what is the best place to put it so that so that it's being preserved and continually maintained? Yeah. With this project with Giselle, um, we're very lucky that she's at UT Austin and they have the Ransom Center there who has agreed to serve as the archive of record for her collection. Yeah. So they have the archival grade and size recordings, but the digital archive we're building has um, lower resolution, right. smaller, easier to stream um, yeah. versions of the video. Yeah. Um, so that was, I mean, and, and while we're talking about, let me try to finish that sentence. <laughs> That is a privilege. That is a privilege that we as tenured faculty in big public institutions have access to that most artists and collection holders and arts organizations do not have. So um, that's been very present for us thinking through what we make and how it can help other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because I have heard stories of people saving it on single hard drive, like oh, external wow. hard drives. And I've heard stories of saving them on hard drives on desktops and then the desktop ages out and it's difficult to get that. Or the person yeah. who has the external drive, you know, passes away or becomes um, not you know, not accessible. <laughs> and then yeah. that data sort of passes into to a place where nobody can get to it until perhaps it is found. And then even then, is it is it in a, a, a format that can still be accessed? And, you yeah. know, there's so many, there's so many little considerations that I know are overwhelming to think about as you're moving through a project like this. And you're right, uh, the, the privilege of having places to store materials and have them preserved and, and cared for, right? It's not even just stored, but if you are able to place it into an archive that has policies about digital content, then you have caretakers. And that's... Yeah. That's really incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it has been. Um, I should probably tell you about what we're doing. Um, so the grant that we got from the NEH was to build a digital archive for this collection of um, multiple performances and rehearsals of these 10 solos. Um, right. And which is, you know, a pretty, it's pretty self-contained little logical collection, which is yes. lovely. Um, at the same time, we're trying to build it in such a way that it can be generalized and shared as a template for other artists. Yeah. So we've had sort of a split brain as we've been thinking about um you know, what kinds of fields are necessary, what kind of information we want to capture. Um, and we are finishing that uh, end of this year, December 31st. <laughs> that is when it's going to be done and ready. Um, we, you know, we're going to share it with the world. So um, 
we're definitely in the kind of push to get that up and running. Um, We have been trying really hard to, um, both Giselle and I are dancers and dance makers. Mm -hmm. And we have been trying to allow that methodology and knowledge and ethics to lead the project, to lead what we build. Um, And that's interesting and and challenging. Um, So an example of that is um, it's just punishingly hard to tag videos where it's just movement and maybe the choreographer is giving information just by making sounds. Like it's not so much a, it's more of a, you know, something like that. And you're like, okay, great. What, how do I translate that into a word that allows somebody to find that? Right. Um, So, you know, that's not a new problem that we've discovered, but it's something that we're trying to figure out how we want to negotiate. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that is to create features that allow the user to compose themselves so you you know hopefully if all goes according to plan this is what what is being made now and and so far so good um you will be able to see a video and clip create a clip for yourself annotate that clip and um either put it in a playlist that you can save and come back to So if you're teaching from this collection, you can have a playlist that you can show the class without having to go back in and scrub through each video and find each section. Um, You can also take those clips and compare them side by side on the screen. So maybe you want to see B.B. Miller performing her work, Rain, in, I'm guessing it's like 1984 or something when it's made. I could be wrong about the exact date. And then you want to see Giselle Mason performing the same thing in 2018, side by side. You can play the same moment of the same dance and see, Mm -hmm. or you can see Giselle performing it in 03 and then performing it again in 18 and see what's evolved, how she's changed, how her interpretation has changed. Um, So those are a couple of ways that we want to allow the viewer to choreograph the material. Yeah essentially we also hope you can find things with you know searching and tags and all of that but yeah um yeah so that's that's what we're doing right now um it reminds me of the kind of uh work that linguists do when they are trying to like annotate and take notation of a new language that is not a written language and how to express um sort of the sounds Uh, it's been it's been a little while since I've uh, you know refreshed myself with linguistic terminology but you know you make a phonetic sound with your mouth and there's a way to phonetically write that out but then it also has so much freighted meaning with it right and you're trying to not only capture the phonetic communication that is happening yeah but also like all of the the connotation and the denotation that is happening with those very simple sounds that allow a dancer to make a movement or alter an an aspect right yeah I mean what you're what you're saying connects to the just really wicked problem of dance notation yeah you know, there are some wonderful dance notation forms and some people who are very good at notating and translating reading yeah. scores. And um, But a lot of us don't know how to do that because um, it's tricky enough that it's not taught um, in a dance studio, for example, if you're going to attend a dance studio. I mean, a lot of universities teach it, but you know, if you think about music and how many variables are recorded in a music score, 
I'm not quite sure how many, but I'm thinking, um, you know, pitch, time, dynamics, instrumentation, um, loudness. I don't know. Uh, I've reached the end of my knowledge there. Yeah. But think about dance and, you know, you have a whole lot of joints and you need to notate down to this one. Because it's really different to do, you know, this than it is to do this. And then that is, that needs to be notated in, in time, in space, in relation to other bodies in space. Right. And it's, it's a big job. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons why video is so important in dance and sharing video and creating access to video is so important in dance. Video isn't notation of dance, but it is, um, it's a very useful record. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Wikibase project because I, I'm yeah. excited to hear how this is translating into uh, metadata that is universal enough um, the establishment of an ontology or a vocabulary that is flexible enough to apply to multiple projects with this, you know, ethic or this ethos of, of dance and choreography as the forefront that you guys are building. Um, so how is that going? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're at the beginning of that chapter of what we're doing. And um, I have to say that kind of hard, kind of reaching back to what you were saying about starting with the embodied and getting to data, like I would never have imagined this is where I would be working. And this is what I would be thinking about like this is exciting. And the learning curve is steep. And that makes it kind of fun and exciting. Um, but also, it, I think it's just really improbable <laughs> that I'm deeply in this sort of um, library science and information science world now. Um, but so what, so we, we, we knew that what we wanted to build, we wanted it to be more than just a freestanding proprietary website that didn't, that didn't connect out. And so um, we started to look at linked data as a way to connect out to other resources. But we also honestly started to look at linked data as a way to reduce our labor um, yeah. and thinking about if we if we create something that can be generalized and shared as a template, we know that other dance artists really are going to need a way to reduce the labor of data entry. Right. Um, so what we imagined doing initially with linked data was to ingest kind of existing subject authorities, mm -hmm. um, looking at the Library of Congress subject authorities, looking at um, VIOF, what does VIOF stand for? I'm not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is um, all, this is a little yeah. new to me as well. Okay. You know, I'm reaching out to my network of people to help me okay. know what's going on. I understand on a high concept level, what is happening. But when it comes okay. down to this, I've, I spent my summer reading a book on linked open data and <laughs> I'm still getting there. Yeah. Well, I'm with you, Sarah. I am certainly <laughs> not an expert. I am, I'm with you. Um, and I've also been really gratified to find um, like Stephen McCall, who you yeah. connect me to people on this campus who know a lot more than I do, who, who are yeah. really useful advisors. Um, but um, so there are a variety of subject authorities. Um, one of the ones is, um, I think it's VIOF is run by the Getty Museum and it's very heavily around visual arts. Um, I could have that wrong. It could be a different one that I'm forgetting. And also we looked at Wikidata. Right. Um, because Wikidata has authority records on um, a lot of artists. Yeah. And we actually found that Wikidata, so the idea was we were just going to suck in place of birth, birth date, awards, 
whatever biographical information the subject authority had and not have to type it in. So that was our initial, how can we, how can we reduce our labor? Um, but then what we encountered was that um, none of them had a lot of information about dance artists. A lot of what we found was wrong. Um, and especially there was especially scant information about women, BIPOC artists. Um, they're just, they were not in the record. Right. And right. that um, that caused us to think, um, and by us, I want to include Whirly Gig. They are the um, developers we've been working on, working with. <laughs> we've also been kind of working on them. They would probably be the first to say. Um, um, we're building on a system that they developed called Collective Access, which is an open source cataloging yes. software. And they have been really good collaborators with us. They have been willing to think about how the software that they've developed can shift and change and accommodate our needs. And yes. I, I credit them with this realization that um, what if we could not only ingest this information from existing subject authorities, but also push archival information back to, to a data commons to help uh, enrich the record, to help populate the record with some of these missing voices. Yeah. Um, so they began, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we were also um, realizing that Wikidata had more information they didn't have a lot, but it had more information on the dance artists we were working with for Giselle's No Boundaries collection than any of the other subject authorities. And because it's crowdsourced, it also then opens a lot of doors in terms of um, opportunities for this kind of, for conceiving of the idea of pushing data back to it. Yeah. Um, so that's become a focus of ours now. We um, are thinking about um, this kind of multi-part system right now. Um, I'll, I'll draw with my hands, like here, down here, this is Wikidata. It has like a hundred million pieces of linked open data yeah. crowdsourced. Um, right here in the middle, is something that we're calling the Dancing Digital Commons, which is a data commons of dance yes. that we imagine we can, we're gonna have to find a balance between democratizing and curating that yeah. is gonna be a big part of this next step of research. Um, this piece here, this Dancing Digital Commons can periodically push data to Wikidata. And it can right. also ingest data from Wikidata. Right. And then there's a constellation. <laughs> See, I'm a dance person. There's a constellation, <laughs> the constellation of other archives and may eventually, hopefully, other individuals who can push data to the commons. And so the dancing digital, oh, sorry, the no boundaries archive that we're building, that is one that's going to be able to both ingest from and push data back to the dancing digital commons. But now we really, it's really exciting for us that other performing arts organizations have expressed real interest in working with us mm -hmm. um, and letting us try using their data to populate this commons. Mm -hmm. So we have um, two really great big partners right now Brooklyn Academy of Music and Jacob's Pillow uh, Dance Festival, um, both old storied um, presenters of performing arts that have done a great job in terms of like they are leaders within performing arts um, preservation and access. Um, and so we're really excited to be working with them. Um, and I can show you a thing if you want me to share my screen and show you a yeah. thing. Let me, um, I'm gonna make you a co-host. I meant to do that earlier. I'd love to see. Okay, so. Um, mm -hmm. So 
So this is a very early demo of what we're working on. Um, WhirlyGig has, and specifically, I'm going to credit Wai Yin Quan is one of the developers at WhirlyGig. She's been working really hard on this. Um, to use Wikibase and the Wikidata integration model to um, create this uh, digital data commons um, that's based on our collection, which is the No Boundaries collection. And I'll show you what that looks like. That's got, it's actually bigger than this, <laughs> but uh, this needs to be updated. Um, you can get a sense of, you know, here are the solos. Actually, you might not actually be able to see this all that well. Let me drive this a little bit to make it bigger. Come on, baby. Um, and somewhere in between. Okay, having trouble with my mouse. Um, but like, here's a solo, no less black. Rain. Um, Rain is um, choreographed by B.B. Miller. Uh, costume designed by Muriel Stockdale. We have a little duplicate here. Maybe Bibi did some of the costumes and Muriel did some, I'm not sure. The composer uh, was Hearn Gagwa. Um, lighting designer, Giselle Mason is sort of, a, she's dancing all of these in our project. So she's kind of becomes the center. Um, so this is the No Boundaries collection or, or yeah. most of it. Um, uploaded to Wikidata, structured as linked open data. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I don't know if we're running out of time, if it's helpful to talk about the triples you can see here, or what do you think, Sarah? Uh, I think we have about 10 more minutes. Um, it is, it's 11.43 right now, and yeah. we have the full hour. Okay. So. Well, if you, like me, are are new to linked open data. Um, what I'll say is, um, according to my understanding of it, it's a way of structuring data to give a piece, to give each piece of data a stable address on the internet, kind of like a URL, but it's yeah. called a URI. And um, the, the way that it's structured is in triples. Um, it's two entities with a property that that connects them. So in this case, um, it's going to be the piece jumping the broom. Mm -hmm. Jumping the broom is one entity. David Rousseau is another entity. And the property that connects them is that David Rousseau choreographed jumping the broom. So yes. this one triple here, this is one chunk of linked open data. Yeah. Um, or linked data. And it's, it's open because it's not proprietary. That his name and the name of the piece are not proprietary. Yes. Um, so that's the no boundaries collection. We we can look at it in this nodal graph on Wikidata. Um, this is what Wikidata has, this might take a minute, has that is pertinent to the artists in the no boundaries collection. They obviously have more information about dance artists, but this is what Wikidata has for the dance artists in the No Boundaries collection, they have 51 records. Right. And it's interesting, like, um, let's see if I can pick one. If you can see, <laughs> yeah, like Jawale Willa Joe Zoller is a very prolific choreographer, but clearly what's happened is that the places that have the that have the resources to contribute to Wikidata are the universities she's taught at, um, the awards she's gotten, Bessie, and you'll see a lot of these folks won Guggenheim fellowships. Her mm -hmm. work is not her work is not represented on Wikidata yeah. hardly at all. Like these are where she's taught, where she's performed. She was a MacArthur felt like, yes, these are the places that like, so we're missing the work. <laughs> That's what Wikidata is missing largely. Um, then if we add, I'm just going to add all of them together in the interest of time, but BAM um, has thousands of records. 
Jacob's Pillow has thousands of records. This again, this little compare demo is just pulling records that are relevant to the artists in the No Boundaries collection, to those 10 choreographers. So um, you can see immediately, it's going to take a minute to load. I'm riffing, I'm riffing, I'm, I'm vamping, I'm <laughs> dancing here while we're loading. But you can already see that it's it's loading a lot more records, 500 yeah. or relationships. Yeah. Um, I think it's fascinating when we're looking at this kind of graphic. Um, so my area of scholarship is, is digital rhetoric. And from a rhetorical standpoint, you can really assess audience of each of these entities, Wikidata and BAM and Jacob's Pillow and No Boundaries by seeing the type of data that they value and include. I think that's yeah. That's a really interesting, you can, you can, you can make some basic assumptions about the organization when you look at the data that they are able to provide, that they contain. I think that's a really important point. Um, one thing that we've learned by this visualization, and I don't know how much I need to zoom in here because you can kind of get the idea that there's a lot of artists and a lot of, or these are the 10 artists again, but mm -hmm. so much more work. Yeah. This is the, actually the work being represented, not just where yeah. they taught. Um, but a couple of things ripping off of what you said. One is um, when we there was another demo that allowed us to search for a particular artist and I don't need to share that right now, but um, it was a, oops, did I stop sharing? I tried to no, stop. Sharing. You're still on. Oh, just moved it. I moved the stop sharing. Okay. Um, so we would put in the name of an artist yeah. and it was such a clear visual representation of who's missing because um, George Balanchine was a name we put in, a European male choreographer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it was 380 or something like that. Records came up, his work, his relationships, his students. Um, right. He is in the record. People have taken the time to um, put him in the record of Wikipedia as well, because Wikidata also includes the, the data from Wikipedia. Then we put in Martha Graham, who's a white, who was a white female choreographer, and we just saw it shrink. Some of her work was represented, but she maybe had 60 records as opposed to right. 300 and something. Then we put in Alvin Ailey, who is a was an incredibly prolific African-American contemporary choreographer. And initially it's it's more now, but we got 10 records for him. And they were all awards he'd won. I mean, this is a person who, whose work has reached, um, you know, he's made eight, he made 80 plus important works, seminal works of dance that reached, I want to say, and I've, I've read this, so I don't think I'm making this up, 25 million audience members. Yeah. Live audience, you know, like really important artists in this country. And there's no, he has no digital footprint. Yeah, he's harder to study. He's harder to find. So that was one thing that this visualization helped us understand. But the yeah. other thing is, as we've been working on the archive, being able to come back to this visualization has been really instructive because it's like, oh, Robert Battle is floating over here in a little cloud by himself. There's actually no connection to the rest of the archive yet. We have to illustrate that relationship. Right. So that's also been really interesting. Yeah. Um, but we're hoping to build this for real. This is a this is um one of the for real things that will happen with this is um, clear attribution. So if you were to click on a work or an artist, you would you would get sent to the archive that links to the archive that provided the information. Um, it might even with this um, you know Universal Viewer and Triple I F stuff I'm talking about. It might even be that you could watch a you could watch a video by clicking on the link. That's that's a dream for me. I'm not sure how close we are to that. And obviously that's gonna depend on, um, it's gonna be on a case by case 
basis in terms of who grants the rights for that to happen. But what we want is this kind of um, universal finding aid where um, archives connect together. You can find those materials, you can use those materials, um, and you can visualize the connections that happen across the field. That's what we want. That's what we are hoping to build. Well, you're taking, you know, pragmatic steps towards that and have like that long-term goal and short-term goals and midterm goals. And they're all connected in a way that makes sense. <laughs> Hopefully. So, <laughs> I can see the through line. Um, I, I just, I love hearing every single time you talk about this project because I learned so much and I just, uh, it, it makes it easier for me when I talk to other people about their projects because everything in your project always seems to me like it's so well thought out and um, planned. And I like that about your project. You might not feel like that. I don't, I mean, I'll just let that sit there then if that's what it feels like to you. It has been um, research in the best way though, that, you know, I think one of the things that makes me love being an academic is mm -hmm. that you can follow a thread and and you don't necessarily know where it's going to take you. Yeah. Um, and I really did not know where this was going to take me, but it's exciting. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. I've been doing a lot of uh, sort of familiarizing myself with ontologies and vocabularies and how those get incorporated into projects. Um, I I don't work in collective access, but I work in Omeka S, which is a similar platform. Um, and it has a lot of the same, you know, qualities and values for linked open data and organization of of items and assets and the ability to associate things with each other. Um, in the way that you're describing, and the the idea of be, because we have so many different Omeka projects happening at the Alabama Digital Humanities Center, the the balance that I see people constantly having to find between um, their desire to describe something rhetorically, specifically, and accurately and their need to be able to describe it in universal terms. It's always such, yes. there's such a, there, there's such a, um, a pull with that, right? And I think that um, the incorporation of the Wikibase Commons for your project is really pulling that into focus in a way that is translatable outside of dance. Um, into other projects that that I'm seeing happening um, just as sort of a, a framework for finding what's really truly necessary in your descriptive metadata mm -hmm. um, that can transcend the particulars of your individual projects, right? Like, yeah. There are some data that's going to be in no boundaries that is not going to be in the dancing digital commons, right? Because it's going to be very, very specific to the vision and the mission of no boundaries and yeah. may not, may not be universalized. Yeah. Well, Thank you for bringing this up because I'm just like, hey, we made a thing and look, here are the properties. But there is so much conversation and consideration around what are those properties. And um, an example is that a property used in dance on Wikidata a lot is ballet master. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not a term that we want to perpetuate. It doesn't work with the no boundaries project at all um right. and um but since it's so present in the in the data 
using it would allow the data to, would would allow our project to be found more readily. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's that question of like how can we push can we push dance studies here? How much pushing can we do? How much of new world making can we make here in terms of how yeah. we describe things and how much will how much do we need to be discovered in a in a rec, in a in a way that conforms to existing structures and standards. Yeah. This is the eternal yeah. like metadata yeah. question, right? There's metadata librarians across the world having yeah. these very conversations about, you know, um terms that are no longer appropriate and even organized in a fashion that is no longer appropriate to the society that we live in, but like it, it is so embedded that it's impossible to weed out. So how do you find ways to um, create relationships with terms? So, so you have the term ballet ma master and perhaps, you know, within, within your ontology, you have relational synonyms built in so that it's, you know, these are the terms that we use now. And when somebody types right. in ballet master, you get a, a instead see this list, right? Right. Or if you hit ballet master in, you know, another project, it will take you to these, these, these newer terms right. with a note in it. Right. And it's, it's fascinating how a project like this can also move forward. Um, the language and the values of the field. I I, ha I might have this wrong, but I think it was in an article by Maria Pacioli at Pratt. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's where I'm getting this information, but that, you know, a wiki data system like this has a lot more flexibility though, too. It's be because, um, because it's fungible, because it's possible to find things in multiple ways. Yeah. Um, maybe as opposed to sort of an older archive structure, an mm -hmm. older catalog structure, there's mm -hmm. some opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So that's also exciting. Yeah. I, I'm excited about it. I'm excited because you have the opportunity to do so many, so many things and make decisions about some of these things in a way that is thoughtful and progressive, but still connected to the history and the legacy of your topic. So I think we're about out of time and I could just talk about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so grateful for you joining me. Um, and I hope that whoever, you know, accesses the podcast will come all the way to the end because I think a lot of the really good stuff has come in, in the last uh, you know 20 minutes or yeah. 15 minutes here but um thank you so much for joining me today yeah. for this thank conversation you so much for having me it's always um both fun and instructive to talk to you so I really appreciate it yeah yeah I have um I, I I'm probably going to need to chat with you about a couple of things sometime in the future but um, it's it's kind of in the pipeline. So, but good luck on your project. I know that we're waiting to hear about um, some future Money. funding. <laughs> <for it. laughs> uh, my fingers are crossed. I have, you know, a great deal of confidence in this project. And I'm so grateful that I'm able to, to interact with it. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.